mendelspod.com Advancing life science research, connecting people and ideas. We're at the Borough Personalized Medicine Conference in San Francisco, and we've asked the keynote speaker, Dr. Church, to join us for a moment. Thank, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Today's show is brought to you by Biomatters, the creator of Genius. Genius is a DNA, RNA, and protein sequence alignment, assembly, and analysis software platform, like a Swiss Army knife for molecular biology. So Dr. Church at Mendel's Pod, we like to shine a light on different aspects of the leaders around the industry, show a different side. And when you came in yesterday, you said you'd just been to this art show, Ars Electronica in Austria. Just wondering what your take on that was. So Ars Electronica is a major international uh, art event every year that occurs in Linz, Austria. Uh, it's a lovely setting that, that in a town that's highly dedicated to these sorts of uh, artistic events. Uh, this particular year I was attending as a, as a keynote speaker and also uh, uh, accompanying a member of my group who is uh, an artist at, uh, of first degree named Joe Davis who, who got this year's Golden Nika Award uh, in the category of hybrid art, which means that he has managed to bridge uh, science and art um, in a variety of ways over his career. The Golden Nika is a pretty prominent award. I, I think it's, it's, it's quite an honor for Joe Davis uh, to get this. It's like the Academy Awards for this particular field of art, yeah. So you gave a keynote there. Was that anything like the keynote you just gave us on <laughs> different kinds of sequencing? <laughs> the, the, keynote, the keynote I gave there was, was quite different. Uh, it, was, it was aimed at a very broad audience. And it, and it actually emphasized uh, some of the things that Joe's art has um, uh, preconceived, uh, to, to, in a way anticipated, where, uh, where life imitates art. Uh, so in 1986, he uh, came up with the first encoding of a digital art object, or any kind of digital object, into DNA. Um, it was a, as a, a, a five by seven black and white pixelated uh, image, and, uh, and basically converted the zeros and ones and ACGs Gs, and then made it into synthetic DNA that then cloned and sequenced. Okay, I'd heard of the poetry into the... Yeah, but this, predate, know, this, this predates is... everything that it, most people have heard of. Most people that write about encoding digital information into new modalities, including DNA, uh, don't reference this work, but it, it clearly was the first. Now, it didn't necessarily, you know, and so, so when we wrote our paper just 2012, we did reference that work, uh, and, um, and, and in that work, we, we encoded a book into DNA. Um, so you can consider that either an artistic uh, statement, is that, is that now that DNA is a uh, suitable, uh, is really scaled up from the 35 pixels that Joe did in 1986 to now 5.2 million bits of information that we can encode. It encodes a draft of a book that includes a full web version of it, including JPEG images and, and a program that's interactive and so forth. Uh, it's also kind of a, uh, a a curious way of looking at, at at things. People ask me on a regular basis, "Where are we going to store all this genomic data?" And so I flipped the whole thing on its head by saying, um, "Let's let's let's store it in DNA." So it's not like Use the converting genome. DNA to, to to zeros and ones, and then you know, right? And so uh, you know, I I think that this has the potential of growing into something where we could have video cameras like this one here which are going directly from photons to DNA, skipping uh, the, the, the steps that we used in, this, in that paper we just published in Science of reading it in an electronic form and then inkjet printing it into organic chemistry. We can go basically from photons to biochemistry. So Very cool. Yeah. So you were just talking about encoding the yeah. DNA. And uh, there's this recent 30 papers out, the ENCODE project. Uh, I just wondered if yeah. uh, you wanted to sort of say your uh, yeah. Say what you think about that. Your take on it. Yeah. So the the uh, Encode project is a, a milestone. It it got some attention. It deserves. Uh, I was actually on the 2004 version of the Encode, the, the first uh, paper. I think it may be the only paper that I'm on with with Francis Collins and Eric Lander. Okay. Uh, the 2012 version is, um, uh, you know, it, I think my 
main critique of it would be, you know, I think it's terrific. Most of what I have to say is positive, but it it it, uh, it stopped just short of showing how you could use it on on disease samples. They had a few examples of diseases, but they did that. That was kind of done in a separate study, and they didn't actually apply these new tools or these semi-new tools to show that that these new elements. So they're, they're basically mapping um, regulatory elements uh, that are of epigenomic significance in the in the you know the dark matter of the genome mm -hmm. uh, in between protein coding regions. The so-called junk. Well, some people call it junk, but I mean I think this is this. We had plenty of evidence. I mean, my thesis was written about how this is not junk. Oh. Uh, and, but but we need more and more evidence and more and more ways of of. Uh, describing it and, and, and uh, analyzing it, but I, I think it would be nice to compare these between the, uh, the diseased in individuals. Um, I think the sort of thing that was missing was having this done on a coherent set of cells and individuals where you know what uh, the full phenotype is. Mm -hmm. So just more variation really because you have the diseased. Um, uh, not just more variation, but more, co more coherence. Uh, in other words, where you, where, uh, so what they would do is they would tend to use cell lines that were unconnected to one another, like, you know, HeLa cells, which is from one individual, and K562 from some another individual, and, and grabbing things that people happen to be have in their lab, rather than saying, oh, here's a, a particular disease cell, here's a, a control from that same individual or from their sibling, or, you know, uh, I think that's the opportunity, which you could s say is in the future, but it could have been in the original study, I think. I think I, I read a quote of Sidney, I think Sidney Brenner, who said, um, it's like junk in your home. I mean, there's junk yeah. and then there's trash. Right. And uh, junk, uh, trash is stuff you throw away. Yeah. Junk is stuff that you keep around right. just in case it might be. Right. It might be good. Yeah. And this could be even better than junk. I mean, in other words, it's not only do you keep it, but it actually has day-to-day uh, activities, you just need to set, find the right developmental or environmental condition for it to have value. So we've had some philosophers on the program lately, we try to mix it up a bit. So I provoked them with this line of Richard Dawkins who said, I think in the last year at an Apple conference or something, that philosophy is dead. Yeah. And his thinking is philosophers haven't kept up with physicists yeah. and scientists and they're sort of becoming obsolete. And so I want to ask you, are scientists the new world rulers? Yeah, I, you know, I think that very often scientists declare that science is dead or physics is dead. Uh, you know, people are, are way too fast at, at uh, you know, it's, 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 it's like people as they grow older, they want to believe that they made the last contribution that really needs to be made. <laughs> and uh, I don't know whether Richard thinks that he's made contributions to, uh, to philosophy, but I, th I think they're... We continue to, to, to discover new things mm -hmm. in, in, in ethics and in, um, and in art and so forth. And, and some of these things are kind of cyclical and they don't look like they're going anywhere, but other ones, you know, it's more like a spiral is, is heading somewhere. Uh, but I mean, in the last hundred years, I mean, science has really come to prominence. So, so, science science is, are, Scientists are considered intellectuals. Yes, that, that's, that's an improvement, I think. I think excluding people from the game, saying, you're done, you're over, that's not good. But including scientists now as intellectuals, I think, is a very positive thing. Uh, you know, it, it, in the when I was a young boy, it was it was really only uh, literary geniuses and political that that were really the the intelligentsia. Uh, I think scientists earn this partly because the, the progress has been significant. Uh, although just technical progress is not enough. It's also some of the questions they raise are profoundly philosophically interesting. So philosophy is not dead. And, uh, and also they make a lot of money. <laughs> and, so, and, they, and in a certain sense they become, you know, celebrities like Bill Gates because he makes money and then he tries to do good with it. And many of them are becoming philanthropists. So I think, uh, I think that there's, there are reasons why, why they're being included in the conversation. They have something to say. Is there a book that stands out that you know that, uh, that influenced your life the most? You know, I, I, there were many books that I, so I was dyslexic when I was young, and so I tend to look at the pictures. Huh. Uh, but there were books about uh, uh, biographies of uh, people like Madame Curie and, and uh, Edison. Uh, I liked inventors from day one. I loved the encyclopedia, the pictures and the encyclopedia and the Time huh. Life series. The thing that had the biggest, if it was not in a book, it was the, the New York World's Fair in the mid-60s. 
had a huge, I just, it was so graphically real that I believed that, that it was true and there was just being withheld from me, that the future was actually just being withheld. And so, so ever since, I've been trying to recreate in the real world what they had created as an illusion at that fair. So know? that was a moment where the future kind of spoke to you yeah, and, was, and it, teased I, you. Yeah, te they, te they were teasing us, basically, yeah. Well, thank you for joining us. Oh, yeah, my pleasure. Today's show is brought to you by Biomatters, the creator of Genius. Genius is a DNA, RNA, and protein sequence alignment, assembly, and analysis software platform, like a Swiss Army knife for molecular biology.